Okay. So good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Natasha Sofia Martinez and I'm a third year PhD student in the Department of Politics and chair of the Student Caucus at the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean Studies at York University. My colleague Alex Moldovan and I will be chairing today's webinar presentation. Hello everyone, I'm Alex and I'm a fifth year PhD student in the Department of Politics at York University. I also sit on the executive of the Sirlac Student Caucus. Before we proceed, I'd like to read a land acknowledgement. York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which the school is located that precede its establishment. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territories of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto uh, has been caretaken by the Ashinaabek Nation the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon, One Pump Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. May we have reconciliation based on social justice and reparations. So just a couple of housekeeping uh, items before we begin. This webinar will be recorded. There will also be a discussion period reserved at the end of the talk, and we encourage everyone to write down any questions they have during the presentation. And during the question and answer period, you can click on the Q&A feature to ask your questions. So titled Climate Change in the Caribbean, the Role of Capital in the Climate Crisis, and the Movement for Climate Justice, today's talk will be led by Maleni Alain and Dr. Esther Figueroa, both of whom we are grateful to for being here today and sharing their important work with us. Today's event is held in association with the organized uh, research units at York University who have come together to contribute to discussing various aspects of climate change. York's first annual Climate Change Research Month supports the university's commitment to climate change action through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. As my colleague Andrea Gonzalez, our internal communications coordinator at the Student Caucus has recently mentioned at our previous event on climate change. The, ev the effects of climate change are increasingly felt in Latin America and the Caribbean, making this topic an issue more relevant than ever. Before we begin, we would like to give a very special thank you to Anna Ford Smith for connecting us both to Malin and Esther, as well as to our CERLAC coordinator Camilla for all her hard work coordinating today's event. Finally, we would like to thank Danielle Robinson, the director at CERLAC, for giving us the opportunity to take the lead on facilitating this webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Esther Figueroa. Dr. Figueroa is a Jamaican independent filmmaker, writer, educator, and linguist with over 35 years of media productions, including television programming, documentaries, educational videos, multimedia, and feature film. Her activist filmmaking gives voice to those outside of mainstream media and focuses on the perpetuation of local and indigenous, indigenous knowledge and cultures, the environment, social justice, and community empowerment. These films are screened and televised all over the world and taught at numerous universities. They include Jamaica for Sale, the award-winning feature documentary about tourism and unsustainable development. Her latest feature documentary, Fly Me to the Moon, is about modernity and the global aluminum industry. She recently created and co-hosted GFF 2020, the first online film festival focused on global extraction. In 2013, Dr. Figueroa uh, was distinguished writer in residence at the University of Hawaii English Department. Her environmental novel, Limbo, uh, which was put out in 2013, was a finalist in the 2014 National Indie Excellence Awards for multicultural fiction. Esther, thank you for bringing, being with us today. Thanks very much for that intro, Alex. Great to finally meet you after our corresponding. Many thanks to CERLAC Student Caucus for inviting me to be part of today's discussion. Thanks to Anna, Camila, Natasha, Alex, and your team for all the work that's gone in today's event. I'm gonna talk for about 10 minutes on the role of in the political economy of the climate crisis with some historical context, as well as mention what is urgently occurring now. And then Melanie is going to give, um, is going to focus on the human rights and climate justice side of things a bit. 
And then um, she and I are gonna just have a little um, conversation about some of the work we've been doing about um, trying to fight extraction in, um, in the Caribbean. And then um, Natasha and Alex can jump in and then we hope everyone will jump in and have a great conversation. So really looking forward to this. So here's my, um, my little context of kind of the political economy of what we're talking about. When you think of the Caribbean, it is unlikely that the first thing that comes to mind is the Caribbean centrality to modernity or capitalism. And when you think of the Caribbean region in relation, relation to the man-made climate crisis, you're more likely to think of the region's vulnerabilities to the effects of climate change, such as powerful hurricanes and other extreme weather events, and consider the region as victims of climate injustice rather than active participants in the processes that accelerate climate change. The Caribbean was indeed essential to the creation of global capitalism and, and though Caribbean leaders are very articulate in their calls for climate reparations and their speeches stress the innocence of the region, Caribbean governments promote extractivist models of development whereby tourism, plantation agriculture and forestry, industrial fisheries, the extraction of hydrocarbons, metals and minerals, automobile centric infrastructure and urbanized built environments are the engines of their growth economies. The anthropologist Cindy Mintz, who spoke of the Caribbean as the most modernized peoples in world history Describe the sugar, pl sugar plantations of the Caribbean as landmark experiments in modernity. He said this because they constituted a mode of labor organization and economic production, which in scale and complexity had no comparison in early modern Europe. The processing of sugar was industrial in a way that predated the so-called industrial revolution by well over a century. Sugar manufacturing used what were then large scale high level technologies of wind, water, heat and steam. And of course it was based on an economic model where the majority received no wages at all. Thus creating enormous profits for the owners of the plantations and the merchants supplying the industry. In 1692, Spain formally ceded Jamaica to the English, and Jamaica became the most valid, valued English, then British, colony because of the geographic location of the island being situated in the Caribbean Sea directly across from Central America and close to important shipping routes. English sponsored pirates stationed in Jamaica raided Spanish, French, and Dutch colonial settlements and ships, their plunder enriching the English crown. Port Royal, located on a sand spit outside of the deep natural harbor, Kingston Harbor, was home to this enterprise. The mercantile center of the Caribbean and the most important port to the English in the Americas, Port Royal became the second largest city in the English empire, and some say the richest city in the world. Port Royal was destroyed by earthquakes and tsunamis in 1692, but by then Jamaica was the most important British colony. Jamaica had piped water and electricity before most places in England and Europe and before places like New York, which are now considered the epitome of modernity. Jamaica was the second country in the British empire after Canada to have countrywide rail service. The wealth, that had been accumulating from piracy and trade was transferred to intensified sugar production and the owners of Jamaican plantations became the richest people in Britain. Their money built not just great houses in Jamaica and mansions and country seats in Britain, but British institutions such as banks, insurance companies, shipping, infrastructure, philanthropy, manufacturing, et cetera all leading to the expansion of the British empire to a quarter of the human world. And many of their descendants became the political elite that continue to govern to this day. In addition, the sugar coming from Jamaica and other parts of the Caribbean 
became the cheap and addicting fuel for the working classes who toiled during the Industrial Revolution in the 18th and 19th centuries. Okay, so the Caribbean and the Americas were essential to modernity and global capitalism. Why is this important when thinking about the climate crisis and the here and now? Man-made changes to the planet that have led to what some call the Anthropocene began as early as when humans developed large-scale agriculture and large permanent settlements but really increased exponentially in scale and speed during the age of European imperialist expansion with the genocide of millions of indigenous peoples, the theft and occupation of the lands and waters they lived within and depended upon and the repurposing of those lands and waters into so-called natural resources that were extracted to fuel the industrialization and civilization of the world. And for this reason, Anna Singh, Donna Haraway, and others have argued that instead of the term Anthropocene, we use the term Plantationocene as a name for the domination and transformation of the planet by humans. The Plantationocene is based upon a particular patriarchal colonialist racist capitalism that began in the late 15th century centered in the Caribbean and the Americas and then spread across the globe. The belief systems, structures, and practices that underpin the plantation and the plantation of scene continue worldwide to this day. When you think of the Caribbean, you probably more likely think of beaches and leisure or violence, ramshackle, poverty, and corruption then you are to think of the Caribbean's ongoing contribution to industrialization and the climate crisis. In addition to the previously mentioned plantation economy and its foundational relationship to modernity and global capitalism, the Caribbean has supplied minerals, metals, and hydrocarbons for over 100 years that have been necessary to 20th century industrialization, modernization, and technology. For example, the Guyanas supplied bauxite, the material of the first stage of aluminum manufacturing for over 100 years. And the island of Jamaica, which has exported bauxite and alumina for over 70 years, was the largest producer in the world from the late 1950s through the 1970s. Trinidad has been an oil producer for over 100 years. In addition, the Caribbean is a region most dependent on tourism and tourism is one of the largest producers of greenhouse gases, habitat removal, shoreline destruction, species displacement, and extinction on the planet. And Guyana is now positioned to become the largest oil producer in the world, transforming from a carbon sink, whereby its immense intact forests hold carbon and supply oxygen, to a carbon bomb with a 10 billion barrels of oil slated to be extracted. It is estimated that burning that oil could release over 4 billion tons of greenhouse gases. The drilling is already releasing millions of tons of greenhouse gases through flaring. And then there is the general carbon footprint of the fossil fuel industry, the transportation and use of the oil and gas, the dumping of toxic waste in the ocean and on land, which is currently taking place, and the ecologic damage of the inevitable oil spill. And in keeping with the Caribbean's extractivist tradition, the agreement between the government of Guyana, Exxon, and other multinational oil corporations saddles Guyana with debt and liability while enriching the oil companies. Yet, the Guyana government portrays their new role as the largest oil producer as one that will catapult Guyanese society into great wealth and prosperity. So other Caribbean nations are trying to follow Guyana's lead. These climate crisis enhancing developments are curious, considering the current political claims as to the innocence of the Caribbean and our deserving of climate reparations and climate justice. Many Caribbean governments currently receive aid in the form of grants from the European Union, United Nations programs, and other multilateral and rich state sponsored, sponsored initiatives. 
These programs might include tree planting activities, climate resilience and mitigation measures such as drought resistance and infrastructure construction for shoreline protection, incentivization of conservation and preservation such as establishing national parks or conservation zones and debt swaps for maintaining intact forests or marine conservation. The Caribbean and the Americas have been embroiled in neoliberal political economies for decades. Governments are heavily indebted and the largest part of their budgets go to servicing debt payments. Indebtedness, of course, goes back to colonial times where France, for example, forced IT to pay for their independence in 1825, the equivalence of 21 billion US dollars with IT taking well over a century to pay extortionist France, when in fact France, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, should be paying IT for the wealth it stole. This pattern of extortion from those countries and banks that were enriched from the pillage of the Caribbean and the Americas continues to this day. And under the restructured neoliberal economies, wildly inequitable societies with oligarchies and small elites who benefit from and control the political order, the focus of governments is on being open to business, facilitating private capital, divesting the public sphere, and not investing in social capital. With low or no taxation for the rich, powerful, and multinational corporations, and high debt payments, Caribbean governments depend on foreign investment and loans and promote industry and development models that require the majority of goods and services to be imported. They are therefore starved for foreign exchange and revenues and turn to the only thing they still own, the rights to their so-called natural resources. All the incentives in the fundamentally unequal and violently structured global capitalist system, therefore, propel the extractivist practices that destroy the planet and continue to fuel the cri climate crisis, to which the Caribbean is extremely vulnerable, yet has been an essential player since its unfortunate role in being at the apex of the creation of modernity and capitalism. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, um, for that extremely interesting presentation and sharing um, a lot of the insights in the role of the Caribbean um, within the climate crisis. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Malen Ellen, who's gonna be um, our next speaker. Uh, Malen is a Jamaican human rights lawyer and a founder of Freedom Imaginaries, an organization that uses human rights law uh, to tackle legacies of slavery and colonialism. She holds a Master of Laws degree from Harvard Law School and a Master of Advanced Studies degree from the Graduate Institute of International Studies, Geneva. She is qualified to practice law in Guyana and Jamaica. Malen, thank you for being with us here today. Well, thanks so much. Um, thank you for this opportunity to discuss climate justice in the Caribbean. And I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Okay, so as a human rights lawyer, my work on climate justice in the Caribbean looks at the climate crisis from a rights based decolonial perspective. And what this means is simply that I focus on the linkages between colonialism, extractivism, and climate crisis in the Caribbean. I look at the human rights implications for the region with a focus on the rights of racialized communities. And then I examine how human rights tools can be leveraged to advance climate justice. And so my presentation will cover these three broad areas. So as a first point and building on Esther's very interesting presentation, the climate crisis is the logical consequence of a racial capitalist system that normalizes resource plundering, indigenous dispossession, and the relegation of former colonies to sacrificial zones of extraction. Across the Caribbean, extractivism is fueling greenhouse gas emissions that aggravate the climate crisis, while simultaneously destroying the food and water sources that are integral to climate resilience. <clears throat> 
The climate crisis is also creating a new category of sacrifice zones as a result of greenhouse gas emissions. Communities are becoming uninhabitable because of extreme weather events, droughts, and rising sea levels. Of course, as Esther discussed, this is a racial justice issue since the nations and peoples who inhabit these sacrifice zones are precisely those nations and peoples who were once colonized on the basis of false notions of their racial inferiority. So before I even begin to talk about the technicalities of human rights law and climate justice, I just want to show you what these sacrifice zones look like in the Caribbean. In the Bahamas, for example, residents are still recovering from the 2019 Hurricane Dorian, which flattened entire communities, causing loss of life and massive displacement. This slide here, this photo shows um, a picture of what they call these white domes in, in North Abaco, where displaced re residents still live in, white, in, in these domes that were built as temporary shelter. And moving on to the next slide, in Guyana, gold mining is destroying forest cover and contaminating rivers from mercury use. And so in this slide, you can see water contamination in one of Guyana's indigenous communities. Meanwhile, the oil and gas industry is fueling greenhouse gas emissions, turning Guyana from a carbon sink to a carbon bomb. In Trinidad and Tobago, spills are a recurring issue that threatens fisher communities and water sources. And in this picture on your screen, you can see someone's hands covered in oil in the aftermath of an oil spill. And then where I'm from in Jamaica, the bauxite alumina industry is gobbling up prime agricultural lands and displacing rural communities. Bauxite refining is also causing recurrent effluent spills that result in fish kills and reduced water quality. So in this slide here, you can see a video I took while on mission in St. Anne in Jamaica, where bauxite mining threatens Jamaica's food security by destroying agricultural lands and compromising Jamaica's climate resilience. And you know, I could go on with examples from across the region, but essentially what I'm describing is a situation of global structural racial, racial inequality in which Caribbean nations remain trapped in a cycle of dependency on extraction and climate vulnerability. But there's also a localized equality analysis that must inform our understanding of climate justice in the region. The climate crisis exacerbates inequities within the region since different communities experience climate change differently. Communities such as migrants, indigenous people, Afro-descended rural communities and women are disproportionately vulnerable to climate change. In many cases, their vulnerability reflect, reflects their broader marginalization in societies that perpetuate colonial structures of racialized exclusion. And so in the Bahamas, back to the example of the Bahamas, Haitian migrant communities experienced the highest levels of destruction and death from Hurricane Dorian. Haitian migrants also risked deportation if they tried to access official assistance, which further added to the challenge of recovery. And when Haitians flee because of climate related weather events, they travel in precarious conditions, crossing treacherous terrains and facing racism and violence on their journey. So in this next slide here, this is a visual of Haitians crossing the infamous Darien Gap, likely en route to the United States. And some of these migrants would have fled Haiti after the successive natural disasters last year. And then the second slide here shows what they encounter when they make their journey across, you know, across the Americas. This is the infamous photo of U US border officials persecuting Haitian migrants. So ultimately, these communities on the front lines of climate crisis are treated as disposable. Their voices are ignored and they are excluded from decision-making processes. Therefore, when I talk about a rights-based decolonial approach to climate justice, I'm talking about much more than the traditional narrative around temperature thresholds. I'm talking about a transformative approach that focuses on shifting power to historically marginalized communities on the front lines of climate crisis. And I'm talking about an approach that is centered on empowering these communities to defend their environment and way of life against unsustainable development. So with this understanding, I'd like to turn now to the human rights and climate justice dimension. So the Caribbean experience illustrates how climate impacts threaten the enjoyment of a wide range of rights, including the right to life, food, 
housing, health, water, and the right to a health, all of which is recognized in, inter in international treaties. As you saw in the images and video that I showed, the threat is existential in nature. And in addition, the measures that states and business actors design and implement to respond to the climate crisis can also threaten the full enjoyment of human rights. In this context, I'd like to briefly discuss three human rights tools for advancing climate justice in the region. And these tools are first, the framework for environmental rights. Second, the racial equality framework in international human rights law. And finally, the framework for reparations. So moving to the first tool. So this right to a healthy environment is increasingly understood as encompassing a safe climate, as well as the right to clean air, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, safe and sufficient water, and healthy and sustainable food. In other words, all of the things that are undermined by extractivist development. This right also encompasses procedural environmental rights, such as the right to access climate information, participate in decision-making around climate policies, and access to remedies in cases of harm. Under this framework, um, states have an obligation to take affirmative measures to prevent human rights harms caused by climate change, including foreseeable long-term harms. In particular, states have an obligation to limit anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases, stop activities that aggravate the climate crisis, mobilize maximum available resources for sustainable human rights-based development, ensure equity in climate action, and ensure accountability and effective remedy for human rights harms caused by climate change. Recent developments in environmental rights have created unprecedented opportunities for rights-based climate action. So at the universal level, last year for the first time in history, the United Nations Human Rights Council adopted a landmark re resolution recognizing the right to a healthy environment. At the regional level, the inter-American system recently recognized the right to a healthy environment as an autonomous and justiciable human right. And this decision builds on the movement for nature rights, which seeks to protect nature's inherent right to exist and reproduce its life cycles. There's also an interesting movement to define the international crime of ecocide. And very recently, legal experts drew up a historic definition of ecocide, which is intended to be adopted by the International Criminal Court to prosecute egregious offenses against the environment. And last year, the ESCASU Regional Agreement for Latin America and the Caribbean entered into force. And what you see on your screen now is an infographic on how this agreement can be used as a tool for climate action. This agreement provi provides a binding legal framework for strengthening climate action through public participation in environmental decision-making, access to justice, and access to information and knowledge. Recent case law at the international level has also opened up important opportunities for rights-based climate litigation. And this wave of opportunity has now reached Caribbean shores. In Guyana, citizens recently filed Landmark climate case that challenges fossil fuel production on the grounds that it exacerbates global warming and threatens the constitutional rights to a healthy environment, sustainable development, and the rights of future generations. But despite this progress, the environmental rights framework is still underutilized in the Caribbean as a tool for climate justice. I think this is primarily because environmental rights are hardly recognized in the constitution of, of jurisdictions in the Caribbean. As seen in the table on your screen, Guyana and Jamaica are the only two jurisdictions that explicitly recognize the right to a healthy environment at the constitutional level. And so the boxes in green across the table show where countries either recognize the right to a healthy environment in the constitution, or they recognize it in legislation, or they have ratified international conventions that enshrine or recognize the right to a healthy environment and procedural environmental rights. So as you can see, we are in a sea of red in the Caribbean. So moving on to the second major human rights tool, and here I want to discuss the framework for racial equality, because as Esther pointed out, and as I was mentioning in the opening of my discussion, climate justice is a racial justice issue, not just at the global structural level, 
but also at the domestic level where certain racialized communities bear the brunt of the climate crisis. So in this sense, the human rights system has anti-racial discrimination treaties and mechanisms that could be leveraged to bolster demands for climate justice. These include the Convention Against Racial Discrimination and also the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination provides an adjudicatory mechanism to consider possible violations under the convention. So the convention does not explicitly mention the environment. However, in the past few years, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has begun to consider the linkages between climate change and states obligations under anti-racial discrimination treaties. And finally, in closing, I just want to mention the third tool, the final tool for climate justice, which is the emerging framework of reparations for ecological and climate debt. And there have been you know, very interesting developments in the region on this front. So for example, in November of last year, Antigua and Barbuda signed an accord which establishes a commission of small island developing states on climate change and international law. This new commission will ask the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea whether they can claim damages from countries that warm the oceans through greenhouse gas emissions. However, this, you know, the potential for reparations as a tool for climate justice in the Caribbean has been stifled by what I consider to be an overly narrow focus on monetary reparations. The legal obligation to provide reparations for slavery and, slavery and colonialism is about much more than cash payments. Rather, this obligation requires states to dismantle structures of racial injustice that are the product of centuries of racial machinery built through slavery and colonialism. In other words, climate reparations must involve the creation of just economic and social systems that build pathways to a truly post-colonial future beyond extractivism. So I will leave it here for now, but I look forward to, to the lively discussion. So back over to you, Esther. Thank you for that absolutely fabulous presentation with all that good and hopeful information. Please stay, come back with your camera. So you've, you've outlined, first of all, um, you've done an amazing amount of work over the years on um, using your human rights approach, your own, your own knowledge. You've worked with all sorts of different groups um migrants all sorts of different groups that are, have their um, human rights being abused and recently um you've been working on the issue of extraction as um as as an area and very very recently you've been in jamaica in communities that are that are um being mined for bauxite and you've been um witnessing and getting declarations from from people, so you know the kind of um, things that are going on. Could you one talk a bit about what you have witnessed and what you see going on in terms of human rights abuses, and then talk a bit about how you see the current human rights tools and the framework, um, and if if they're able to handle you know these kind of on the ground cases. Um, that we're trying to stop or, you know, trying to get some sort of um, reparations or something in return for the kind of abuse and sacrifice that you mentioned, these sacrifice zones that actual real people live in. Thanks, Esther, and, and great questions. Um, on the first question about human rights abuses that I've witnessed, I've been spending quite a bit of time in Jamaica's cockpit country, which for the audience, this is a, an area of extreme cultural significance and environmental importance. It is the home of the Maroons who claim these lands as their ancestral lands. And it is also home to deep rural communities who depend on the cockpit country area for physical and cultural survival, meaning they have a very close connection to their land they grow you know, crops for subsistence or to sell in the market, and their identity is very much linked to their rural livelihood. And so in cockpit country right now, as in other parts of Jamaica, 
the government is allowing and participating in the mining of bauxite and the processing you know, of bauxite right in the middle of communities where people live, work, play, go to school. And so what I'm describing is open mine pits, literally in the backyard of, of, of people, of families. And I think I would have to show you a picture for you to, to really believe and understand what I'm saying. Because when I say it's in the backyard, I mean, it is you open the door and you are looking down a bauxite mining pit. And these are lands that, you know, the community relied on for farming, which, as I said, is part of their livelihood, in addition to, you know, contributing to Jamaica's food security, because this area in St. Anne is known as the gar garden parish of, of Jamaica. So in terms of human rights abuses, I mean, where do I start? Uh, bauxite mining is fueling ecocide. I think it falls within the definition of ecocide that is developing in international law when we talk about, you know, egregious offenses against the environment. It is, you know, violating rights to health because I've been documenting respiratory illnesses related to the bauxite mining, the dust produced. So we're talking about communities who are suffering from serious respiratory illnesses. We're talking about water contamination from dust. And I've seen, you know, the water that the communities have to drink, it's, it's literally brownish in color. And this is happening at a time when climate crisis threatens both food and access to water. So bauxite mining is basically destroying their climate resilience. And importantly, bauxite mining in this area, as in other parts of the world, particularly formerly colonized nations, what we're talking about is cultural genocide because we're, we are seeing the total devastation and I would say eradication of rural communities who have pre preserved legacies handed down from you know, the descendants of slaves who you know, fled into the hills, the hilly interior of cockpit country and set up their own unique way of relating to the land. So what I would say is that you know, we're talking about human rights violations of catastrophic proportions and without urgent intervention, extractivist development in Jamaica in the context of bauxite mining will you know, result in irreparable harm. So the second part of your question, Esther, and I'll, I'll be brief on this part is, you know, can the human rights framework handle, handle this um, massive issue? The answer is yes and no, uh, which seems contradictory to what I just presented, <laughs> but, the human rights framework has tools that can be leveraged to address specific aspects of what is happening at the domestic context. So yes, if the right to a healthy environment is justiciable, we can argue on, on those grounds. What the human rights framework cannot do is address the underlying structural context that makes these violations possible. And for that, what we need is movement building where human rights actors are allied with grassroots actors on the ground. Because as I, as I mentioned, the, the issue is complex, it's historical, it's structural. And so that's where I think the solution lies. Multidisciplinary cross movement, movement building that brings together different actors. So Esther, I actually want to, to, to throw the question back to you. Um, and my question is two, like two pronged. So um, I've worked with Esther for a while and Esther has, has been very, she has guided me a lot in terms of my development and understanding of how human rights law can be, be used in the context of extractivism. And what I would love to hear from Esther is, first of all, how do you see your role in dismantling these underlying structures that are leading to fueling climate crisis. And secondly, what do you have to say to human rights actors who purport to be working on building what they call in, in the UN declaration, an international and social order in which everyone can live in dignity and have their human rights respected? Great, so I think maybe a slight detour actually connects to the second part of the question, which is in Jamaica, we have a prime minister right now who is seen as in some ways a leader um, 
on the world stage in terms of demanding climate reparations, talking about our vulnerability, the unjust climate injustice and that kind of thing. Um, the Jamaican government is getting a fair amount of money, um, for example, in Coptic country um, to plant trees. There's other, other types of activities that the uh, climate resilience or mitigation base that the government has gotten. Um, and so you have this, this interesting disconnect that goes with the human rights actors and the human, human rights systems in, for example, the United Nations, where on the one hand, you have very strongly worded um, intention, right, that have to be balanced against a system that says each country is its own sovereign nation state, and can decide for itself what happens, right? And within that sovereign nation state is one of the worst, which is the act of the sea, right? The, the, the law of the sea, excuse me, which allows for these large, you know, you can be a tiny little atoll like Nauru, which has just, um, you know, started the process where we can start deep sea mining. You know, you can be this tiny, you know, a few miles across, but then you have 200 miles of your own exclusive economic zone, right? So for example, with Guyana, they're not mining on the land, they're mining way out in the sea because that's part of their sovereign zone, right? So we have this strange thing where, you know, on the left hand is saying, this is terrible. And the right hand is saying, it's my right, you know? And some of the same decolonial language that you're using that's so important also reinforces that it's my right, okay? So that each, because of colonialism, racism, um, oppression, extractivism, countries that were colonized, right, feel that they have the right to have the same standard of living, the same practices, the same piece of the pie, so to speak, right, as everyone else. Right. So then you have to negotiate that. And so you get into this situation where the human rights, you know, strongly worded, et cetera. But then there are all these exceptions because you I mean, even the Pope, when he made his, you know, his very powerful statement about the, you know, what humans were doing to the earth. There was a whole section that must have been written by, you know, um, assistants you know, who write this stuff for the UN because it said, but we have to, uh, you know, we have to respect everyone's sovereign uh, nation state rights and everyone's right to develop the way they need to, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're in this awkward situation where we're getting mixed messages and then we have to ask, what is the more powerful structure, right? Or what is the more powerful system in the world that can impose its will? And unfortunately, it seems to be brute power as in warfare, as in the amount of money that goes into armaments, et cetera. And then it's the power of violent systems, systems that are such as misogyny, race, um, class, et cetera, that are systems into which humans are born that they did not ask to be born into. And then how do you make those systematic changes? You know, And we see the violence where countries such as Jamaica or Chile or anywhere in the world, right? You know, Cuba has been under this embargo for you know, decades, right? And that's legitimate, you know? How can that be legitimate? Um, so, when you do try and make these changes for yourself within your sovereign nation state, you're not so sovereign because some colonial power or some stronger power comes in and doesn't allow you to make those changes. So for me, you ask at the work that I do, which is um, basically trying to help communities organize and fight against their oppression in whatever form that's taking. It's been very much around indigenous um, reclaiming of their own worldviews and lands and, and systems of being in the world. And then in the Jamaica and the Caribbean, it's about fighting colonial development and extractivism and extraction on the ground 
I cannot stop or change these large scale systems. All I'm trying to do beyond um, trying to get media focus to uh, emergencies is trying to make people realize that actually the world, there are other worlds. The world, the world we live in is not inevitable. There are other ways of being, there are other ways of thinking, there are other ways of relating. And that this has not always been like this. And so it does not always have to be like this. And that's basically, you know, I'm not sure that's much better than the human rights framework, <laughs> but that's pretty much it. Um, so thanks for that. Do you want to follow up or do you want Natasha and Alex to jump in? Uh, uh, Natasha and Alex can jump in. <laughs> Thanks, Esther. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Esther. Yeah, they're just thinking about other worlds and other possibilities. Oftentimes when we reflect on, on these issues of climate change, of, of environmental devastation, it's so easy to be pessimistic, but that relentless optimism just kind of fills me up with gas. Um, I guess I want to just open the floor too to, the, to our audience members uh, at this time. Uh, so please feel free to submit a question or comment through the chat uh, or on the, the question or answer feature on, on Zoom. Um, I guess since I'm, I'm on the panel, I suppose I could ask a question first. Um, so from a lot of your discussion, one of the, the big takeaways I, I, I guess I took uh, was that governments aren't necessarily our friends. And like you, you, you were saying that, you know, uh, with the Jamaican government, you know, kind of making overtures to, to kind of climate reparations while at the same time being, being pressured by multinationals, big capital, uh, the imperialist powers and what have you. Um, I, I just, I would like to ask you both, um, what kind of civil society movements are we seeing? Like you were talking about movements of Afro-descendant people uh, and indigenous people uh, reclaiming these worldviews. Like how, how do they kind of directly interact with, with these mining companies and with the governments uh, that I suppose is, is speaking out of both sides of its mouth. Melanie, you go first, I'll follow up. Okay, sure. So that's a great question. Um, in, in, my, in, in my impression of things, right, there is a strong anti-extractivist movement across the Caribbean because, you know, the Caribbean is home to the rural indigenous Afro-descended peoples who really depend on the environment for their way of life, as I mentioned. So, you know, they see extractivism as an existential threat to their way of life. So the question then becomes, if it is so challenged on the ground, how is it that governments are able to push through extractive projects in record time? And the answer is simply uh, neo-colonial and colonial governance forms that exclude, you know, these marginalized communities from access to information, public participation and access to remedy in environmental decision making. And this is playing out in my work in Jamaica, for example, where communities don't even have basic information like when mining will take place in their backyard. It's taking place in a context where there is very little civic space for these groups to access you know, decision makers and have their views counted Instead, their views are being, you know, stigmatized as anti-development or, you know, fringe or, too, you know, too radical. And then even if they want to take action to challenge extractivist projects, the court is going to tell them, well, if you want to do something like ask for an injunction to stop the total devastation of your livelihood, you have to contemplate costs prohibitively high, which means that the communities who need it most can't even access the courts. And so to answer your question, Alex, that is how the government in complicity with private actors push through harmful extractive product projects um, without the participation or even consent um, of communities who are most impacted. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that, you mentioned the colonial development models. And I think that certainly from when I was a child, um, the bauxite industry has been portrayed by the government of Jamaica and by the industry itself, as has tourism. Um, so I'm talking, I remember billboards and ads and, you know, um, but currently in Jamaica, for example, for the bauxite industry of which the government is a part owner um, and is in partnerships with, 
you have constant, you know, stories in the newspapers, on the radio, on the television, in social media, etc., that are always about the good that the that that the you know the industry is and does. And even if there is a negative, it's always um, balanced by the economic necessity that it provides. So there's the concept, the greater good, um, and um, I think that. This notion of the greater good is something we all, all colonial societies have, um, have suffered from. So that in nation building and in the creation of the new nation is, is this notion of the greater good. And that um, though no one's going to say it, that certain people are sacrificable and certain places are sacrificable, um, their concerns will be just brushed away. And so we've had a series of um, editorials in our um, the Daily Gleaner, which is one of the oldest um, in so-called independent uh, newspapers in, in the Western world, actually, in the, um, uh, the Americas. Um, and whenever it says that there's, it's just kind of been repeating the, the beliefs of the, of the sector, of the bauxite sector. So, it says there are problems, but then it says there is no other, you know, there's no, uh, there's no other choice. There's no other economic engine of development, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that it's, even though you have people, especially those who are being directly affected by the mining, they're very much against it. But the middle class, the ones who kind of believe in the nation, the one who believes it's patriotic, and this goes for oil, oil extraction in Guyana, for example. The issue becomes not that extraction is bad and that you are committing ecocide and genocide and um, basically destroying the lives and livelihoods of, of Afro-descended rural people, but that this is necessary for nation building, you know, and that they have to be sacrifices, et cetera, et cetera. So it's this argument of the greater good that permeates our kind of development notion. Thank you for that. That was really insightful. And I mean, I have a lot of questions right now um, and things that I want to raise, but I do realize that there is a question in the chat. So I will read that out. Um, let's see if this works. Okay, so the question is uh, by Brianna. She's, uh, they ask, what do you think the role of urban planning is in the climate crisis when building towards climate resilient cities in the Caribbean context? If so, how can planners engage with these communities and help mobilize their right to a healthy environment? Melanie, you want me to go first? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, two things on that. Um, I was recently speaking with an environmental planner um, about the question of what is practical and doable. I would say one, that we need less cities. In other words, uh, what we need is a love for, understanding of, and um, embracing of the rural. So to start with, let's not start with the urban and the cities, let's start with the rural and let's, um, stop destroying the rural, stop denigrating the rural, stop saying that rural people are stupid. And this happens in the US as well, okay? This happens everywhere, okay? Rural people are not stupid. You depend on them for food, stop denigrating them. And um, let's make the rural um, way more survivable, okay? Um, but in terms of urban planning, because, you, because of displacement, okay? Because rural people are displaced, they're pushed. This is again all over the world. You have these mega cities. There is out migration because the rural has been denigrated, taken over, captured, and displaced. You then have these unplanned rural sprawling places, okay? And for that, I would say, and this goes to architecture generally, that until we stop building the way we build, um, whether it is habitation, whether it's infrastructure, you name it, um, energy, you know, unless we stop damming rivers, unless we stop building the way we do, unless we stop wasting resources the way we do, there is no future in terms of the climate crisis. 
I'll let Melanie jump in. Thanks, Esther. And I think, you know, that's that's a great question. And it's something that I am only like just now getting into in terms of understanding. And I have a colleague um, named Roger Malcolm. He's the founder of an organization called um, Regeneration. And, you know, he, in a webinar I had some time ago, he spoke a lot about separation and the separation that takes place in, you know, like urban settings where people are kind of removed from their connection to the environment and their connection to each other. And this is like an inherent, like a, a natural consequence of how cities are designed, you know? And so what he got me to, you know, what I started thinking about thanks to his kind of like presentation on, on his thinking on separation and regeneration is what if cities were designed or not cities actually, the, the, fr the frame of reference wouldn't even be cities. <laughs> what if our spaces were designed in a way that, that replicates nature's cycles? Because in nature, everything is in balance. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is too much or too li little. Everything kind of maintains a balance. Whereas I think cities are the exact opposite, the other end of the spectrum, where nothing makes sense. I mean, there is just so much waste. There's no like logical explanation of why things are organized the way they are. And then we're separated in such violent and, and harmful ways from our families, from our source of survival, which, you know, like food and water, you know, I can't eat, there's some plants, there's some fruits, for example, and vegetables that I'm embarrassed to say, I don't even know what they look like in their natural form. <laughs> I just know what it looks like packaged in a supermarket. So that's what I would respond to. That replicate second, thinking about this question of separation and how we can, you know, address that. Perfect, thank you for that. We also have, um... Another question um, from one of our attendees, Tika, who asks or who says, thank you for this deep and insightful discussion. Alex's question and your responses have taken up my question, but I still do wonder, how do we politicize these issues across the region? By that, I mean, where is the space? How do we generate a space where these issues become part of the political agenda? And there is a space for a broad critique of the neoliberal, quote, there is no alternative, end quote, agenda. Melanie, please take that. And also, Natasha, I want to hear from you and not just reading questions. So please also jump in, OK? Uh, great. Just great question as well. I think to politicize is, is I guess, really to, to mobilize, you know, mobilize people on the ground, taking advantage of, you know, like the communicative possibilities of the 21st century in terms of building connectivity. Um, but also in terms of putting forward strong ideals and bold visions that people can rally around, you know, a process of, you know, cross movement um, consensus building so that there is a shared understanding of our common like threats and, and, and challenges and a shared understanding of possible solutions. And here it's not about coming up with like the best alternative. It is just about creating platforms for understanding and creating you know shared solutions for moving to something different so i think that is one way to politicize you know some of the issues we've been talking about and over to you esther <laughs> well over to natasha i want to hear what she thinks mm, so i mean like i said before, I'm still new into this whole theme of, you know, the climate change uh, movement and the crisis and the ways in which, you know, we can politicize this. But I mean, from my own work as well, I really grapple with this question of, you know, how to manage um, the actions top down, but then also how can we ensure more of a grassroots approach and incorporate this? And I don't think I have an answer for that, as opposed to, I think, just ensuring that there is access and that there is resources. And I really like the way in which you both put, you know, engaging with the community and hearing what they want. And I mean, the one question I had um, for Melen was, 
you know, you're working um, with these communities on the ground. And I'm curious, specifically in terms of like the bauxite mining, um, has this contributed, you know, towards, you know, migration away from these areas um, because of the reasons that you mentioned, right? Both like the health reasons, you know, uh, but at the same time, I can also see a lot of perhaps um, the economic like tensions that folks have to like make, right? Like the decisions in terms of like their livelihood and what this also means as well. So trying to balance, again, the harmful effects of bauxite mining, but also, you know, their livelihood. So I'd just be curious to hear more on this. And I don't know if that answered the question, but that's kind of where my thoughts are going around. Uh, yes, in fact, you know, the bauxite alumina industry has resulted in first a, a context of land grabs, where farmers have been dispossessed of their family land passed on from generations, and then a process of massive displacement, where entire communities are, are literally just uprooted and placed in another area, far away from their farmlands, far away from the community that created, you know, like a social fabric and context. And what you're seeing in some of these communities is that people who would have, you know, grown up in this rural livelihood are being given like a sum of money and maybe they feel good in the moment about getting that sum of money. But unlike, you know, a fruit tree that bears continuously, the money runs out. And so the heritage that, you know, the land that could, they could have passed down from one generation to the next is gone. And so over the course of, you know, just a couple of generations, the loss is, is something that has never been quantified, I don't think. Some of the earlier studies may have tried to quantify this, you know, the loss through displacement and dispossession. But um, yes, it, it is a, the bauxite alumina industry is fueling massive displacement and massive, as a result, massive devastation of rural livelihoods that could have been passed down from one generation to the next. And Esther, oh, just yes, to add to, no, just just to add to that, in the West Indies, well, in in the Americas, um, we also have a kind of romance about migration, right? Because everyone has had to do it, and so many of the, um, whether movies or or fiction or 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 whatever, or the or the discourses, narratives that we've we've built around this, so these kind of brave, resilient people who have gone to make a better living somewhere, you know, that kind of that kind of um, narrative, when in fact, many people would have stayed, right, you know, to this day, right, um, many people would have rather have stayed and not crossed a dangerous sea, or crossed a dangerous desert, right, or, or or uh, tried to smuggle themselves in the in the belly of a plane and freeze to death, right? These extreme actions that people take is not romantic, right? It's being driven by something. And so I don't know, for those of you who are not from what's called the West Indies, which is kind of the English, British, Caribbean, um, there's something called the Windrush generation. This is a generation that started going to the UK in the 40s. And there's a great romance about it. There've been films and series and <clears throat> there's also struggles around it because some of those people are being deported back to Jamaica, et cetera, et cetera. What is never said is that a great impetus for the Windrush uh, generation to leave Jamaica was because the bauxite industry was acquiring all of the land, okay? And for many people who didn't quite have a sense of, they weren't in a cash economy, they didn't understand the kind of market capitalism, when they were offered cash for their land, it seemed like a lot of money, right? But it was basic theft. And they left, right? They left forever. And what happens when you leave forever, okay? So we think of the migrant, the brave one leaving for the better. What happens to those who are left behind? What happens to the heritage? What happens to the land? What happens to, the, to all of it, right? What happens to the ancestors? All of it, right? And so I think we need to really interrogate this romantic notion of the resilient migrant who's trying to do the best for their children and think about those who are risking their lives. Why are they risking their lives? And often, 
it's not just, you know, it's yes, it's war, it's so-called natural disasters, etc. But it's 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 the kind of land grabs that Melanie has been talking about. It's the kind of structural violence that the state participates with, um, you know, with extractive industries. Such well crafted responses. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, I guess, read the the next question. Uh, it's from Emmanuel in the chat. It reads. Uh, how would you measure the level of climate activism or climate movements in the Caribbean? Is it high or low? Are they making an impact? Lenny, you want to try that? Sure. One of the interesting things I've noticed uh, is that there are a lot of movements that I would classify as, you know, climate justice movements, just because that's kind of like the buzzword now. But communities on the ground aren't using the frame of climate justice, you know, that's kind of like it is it is a typical, you know, example of how things that happen on the ground are kind of like repackaged in elite spaces and then presented in a way that communities don't even understand. So uh, climate is not a word that I've ever used in any of my community engagements because that would not make any sense to anybody. <laughs> but there I consider the anti-extractivism struggles of rural communities as squarely within the climate justice movement. I consider what's happening in cockpit country where farmers are resisting extractive projects on their rural lands as squarely within the climate justice struggle. I consider what's happening in um, Barbuda with respect to you know, these Afro-descended communities who've maintained their communal land system as stewards of their environment, I consider that as a climate justice struggle. And so essentially what I'm saying is that yes, oh, and importantly, we have in the Caribbean communities, you know, indigenous communities who have maintained this deep connection with their ancestral lands and have maintained their traditions, their language, which holds like keys to understanding in terms of relationships with nature. I consider that as squarely within the climate justice struggle. So in fact, I would say to the international community that the Caribbean landscape, I think, is fertile ground to understand first what climate injustice is, but also what a future beyond climate crisis could be if we listen to these uh, communities and their imaginings, lived practices of, you know, for them it's subsistence practices, but it's also a key part of their cultural identity. And I, I'd like to really second what Melanie is saying, because what's happening is certain organizations um, are, are funding, um, you know, this, um, whether it's organizing for climate justice, whether it's youth for justice, climate justice, or these studies about climate crisis and, and, and you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And what happens often is a, a very particular and this is not just typical, of course, of, of climate change issues. It happens whenever you have this kind of concerted liberal effort, right, to, to, to fix a problem. Um, so you have this, you know, these people come in with this, with this framework of what is, you know, what is the climate crisis? What, what are the solutions? What is climate justice? Um, and then you have money going to primarily middle class people, you know, who are pro environmental professionals or NGO professionals or whatever. And what Melanie is saying is the people on the ground who don't understand this language, okay, and when they speak um, in, in, you know, whether they're speaking Haitian Creole or in Jamaica or vernacular or whether they're speaking, you know, um, Caribbean Spanish or whatever, you know, they're not going to be understood and they can't understand what's being said to them, right? So instead of coming in with this framework and this funding, you know, for more NGOs and middle class and artists and all this kind of stuff, you know, go into the communities that are under, under uh, existential threat, you know, and give them those resources, you know, instead of going to another art or I'm sorry, I'm an artist, I curate art shows and I love artists. But instead of giving it to, you know, another, you know, world renowned artist who is going to have a suddenly going to do an art something about climate change or or school kids are suddenly going to write poems or something. Okay, 
go to those communities that are in existential threat who already, as Melanie has said, have the worldview, have the language, have the subsistence practices, have the knowledge and keep them alive. You know, that would be the best. Grace, you both raised like really interesting and powerful points. And before I go on to the next question, um, I just wanted to pivot back a little bit to your your comment on, you know, this concerted, you know, liberal effort by, you know, third party organizations. And just recently this week, we also hosted another talk on climate change where we had um, an economist uh, with ECLAC who was discussing the big push for sustainability um, and not to go into it too in depth, but just essentially to give um, the viewers some background information. But essentially, this you know sustainable development project um, that uses a combination of economic, industrial, social, and environmental policies um, to ensure uh, overall like equity and recovery um, and overall you know relaunching development. So I guess my question would be you know. Um, in your experience, what role does ECLAC play? Like, have they had a presence um, up until this point in terms of fostering these conversations with um, civil society or um, government representatives? Um, and then also following that, um, you know, is this like an appropriate framework based on your, again, your experience um, with the situation that's going on within these regions? Um, could it be a useful tool? Esther, you want to go? No, I have no idea. You go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, that was you're talking about ECLAC, and and what would be the tool exactly? I didn't follow the tool. Yeah. Is... So they were discussing that they were going to be, um, you know, they're trying to adopt this framework that pushes for overall sustainable development, such as like green policies, for example, and they want it to be able to be adopted in regions like the Caribbean. So you know, for hearing that and then hearing, you know, your conversation today, it's, it's almost as though, you know, I, and I'm really for, you know, more of a grassroots approach. So I'm just wondering, you know, what can an organization like this, what role can they play? Do they even play a role? Or is it better to adopt, again, kind of what we were mentioning more, you know, investment in terms of the grassroots movements that are ongoing right now? Well, I think the answer to your question lies in the fact that I was about to quickly Google ECLAC. <laughs> Is that the, the economic, the something commissioned for Latin America and the Caribbean? <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's, you know what? And that's also why I asked that question, because when I heard, <laughs> you know, these conversations, obviously, oftentimes these organizations, you know, try and engage in this collaborative effort. But is this actually being you know, spoken about on the ground? Is it actually having an impact? And I think that's the gap that I wanted to not highlight, but, you know, raise, is, is this actually happening? Um, Natasha, I think that's a brilliant question. And I think I answered it for you, like, un like inadvertently. But um, my experience is that these organizations, you know, like the Latin American and Caribbean, whatever, uh, they usually marginalize the Caribbean in terms of knowledge production and agenda setting so that the Caribbean and Caribbean communities, especially the most marginalized communities within Carib the Caribbean region, are not equal participants in framing policies and solutions. We are recipients of knowledge and we are told kind of like how, what to do and how to do it. And so, I mean, I don't know a lot about ECLAC, but what I would say is that my general impression is that these organizations reproduce and benefit from historical structures of racialized exclusion. That mean that you know, the Caribbean is not an equal player in these negotiation, negotiations. And so I tend to not be too interested in what they're doing at that level, except where there is like a coincidental alignment between the, you know, like the research that they produce or the tools that they provide and what, what needs to be done at the domestic level. Sorry that it's overly pessimistic, but. <laughs> no, I think, you know what? And I think, um, I thought that I expected that answer, but I think it was, you know, powerful hearing it from you folks that are, you know, doing work on the ground and it's important to raise, you know, there is a, there does exist a disconnect, right? And it's important to make that known um, in order to kind of reinforce other movements that are kind of going on on the ground. Um, 
I'm just going to pivot to the next question. So it's by Danuta, um, who asks, what do you think about all the myths uh, being circulated forever, which just fuels exploitation, ecocide, racial structures, for example? Um, they had seen a graph which shows that natural resource extractivism actually creates more unequal, poor, and more violent countries. Esther, you want to go? Um, well, I'll, greetings, Danuta. Glad you're here. Um, I think that the graph is correct, um, that you do end up with more unequal, poor, and more violent countries. Um, I'm not sure about what the myths are, so, so maybe you can explain that. But if you mean that it causes conflict because you basically have this promise, often an over-promise of some kind of economic benefit, that accrues to very few people. And then you have um, clashes over people's livelihoods. And then you have a lot of kind of um, ambivalence, right? Because you might have someone who's getting, part of their family is getting, you know, some kind of economic benefit, but others aren't, or parts of the community. What we've seen um, in um, the areas that Melanie has been looking at with bauxite mining in, in Jamaica is that you do, you have this, these immediate community tensions because one person hears that somebody else is getting compensated more than them or somebody is being compensated who they don't think has a right to be compensated, et cetera, et cetera. So on every level, you end up with this kind of gossipy, um, you know, inner fighting kind of struggle um, and that can go all the way up, right? You know, to, to entire governments and ministries and all of that kind of stuff. So sorry, Danuta, I'm not sure exactly the, the myths that you're referring to, but I would definitely agree with your conclusion. Melanie, do you have something to add? Uh, well, in, in terms of myths, since I see, you know, natural resource extractivism in the mix, I would assume that those myths are the myths developed by or former colonizers and their vision of progress, which of course is based on overconsumption, over exploitation of, of you know, natural resources. And these philosophies of racial or other difference, which creates you know, a group of people who are to you know, live the good life. And then another group of people, as Esther said, you know, who are sacrificed, who can be sacrificed you know, in service of the accumulation of capital. And this accumulation, of course, happens for the benefit of, you know, the set of people who have been racialized as superior. So I think these myths are extremely harmful. These are the myths that form the current social imaginary around racial capitalism, so that we are in an uncomfortable position where we now have a stake in our own oppression and in practices that will definitely lead to our inevitable destruction if, if we don't change. So, um, you know, I myself grapple with these myths because, you know, I often wonder if we transition away from the current world order in the way that I am, you know, very bold, boldly proposing now, what would that mean for my current lifestyle, which, you know, I'm very much accustomed to. And, you know, because so these myths have been like, accepted to the point of near invisibility. And so Danuta, um, I think your question is very important. These myths are at the heart of what I think are the greatest obstacles to transition. And also great to see you Danuta, thanks for your question. <laughs> I guess I just wanna, wanna follow up on, on this question of myth and, and kind of segue it in, into a question of futurism. Um, how does thinking about the future as, as you know, fighting past these, these structures of, of colonial modernity, um, past these institutions of extractivism, how do we, how does it futurism feature in your works? Yeah, well, I mean, Malini's whole, you know, um, I don't want to call it an organization, whole uh, movement is, is freedom imaginaries, right? So, and and um, coming out actually of a talk I gave at Serlac, uh, I can't remember last year, the year before, um, came this notion of imagining futures beyond extraction, right? So I think the word imagining and imaginary comes up over and over because if you can't 
if you can't imagine, you know, on any level, you know, if you're, if you're in any situation in your life um, and you can't imagine an alternative, you can't imagine a way out, you can't imagine um, joy, you can't imagine pleasure, you can't imagine something else, um, then I don't know. Um, it becomes very different to have change that you yourself have any agency in. Change is going to happen every day anyway, right? Every, every moment is change, right? Um, every second is change. But in terms of change that you yourself are trying to um, have some agency over within yourself, um, within those that you're with, um, within anything, um, as opposed to just change happening, because change happens all the time and it will, then I think a notion of the future and an imaginary is very, very important. And for me, that's why, you know, even though I'm, you know, I'm trained as a historian and I gave my, I always give my little historian, blah, blah, blah. Um, for me, actually spending less time in the past and more time in the future is very, very important. I'll let Melanie go. go. Uh, yes, I, I agree 100%, Esther, you know, on, so like on the website for Freedom Imaginaries, I, I kind of have this phrase that says, if we can, if we can imagine change, then we can achieve it or something like that. If we can imagine it, we can achieve it. And, and that's because I think that because of the inevitability or seeming inevitability of capitalism, and because we have been indoctrinated into this way of life, we don't really, and then also because of issues of separation and just the busyness of life, there's never any time to imagine something different. You know, instead from, you know, since I was a child, I've been just put on automatic pilot, you know, go to school. They indoctrinate me with a bunch of knowledge that I never asked for, <laughs> you know. They, they told me who I was before I even knew who I was, you know, so, and, you know, life just gets so busy. So like, when do we actually imagine, you know, alternative futures? So I think creating spaces to just imagine is extremely important in creating change. And if those spaces could be diverse and inclusive, you know, and safe spaces where diverse voices can feel empowered to share their imaginings, I think that could, you know, do wonders in terms of promoting change. Perfect, thank you. I am just cognizant of the time, folks. Um, so if we didn't get to your question, um, I would ask actually, Malin and uh, Esther, if you don't mind also just putting into the chat, perhaps your contact information, if folks are interested in following up, um, then you're more than welcome um, to connect. Um, we just want to be, again, thanking everyone for being able to take time out of your day to come and, you know, attend this important and timely webinar. Thank you again, Malene and Esther, for your powerful presentations today. I think I speak for most of us here when I say that, you know, not only are these important conversations and topics to be had, and even though we have to think critically about these concepts, I think you know, what really came out through these presentations is also, you know, we have to act on this, right? It's not something that can just be done in isolation, um, you know, between, quote, the global north versus the, the global south. It has to be uh, a solidarity movement and a solidarity effort um, by everyone involved in this and implicated in this. Um, we would also like to mention for our audience members, um, particularly if you're an undergrad or a graduate student, um, that is doing work on Latin America and the Caribbean to keep up with us. Um, we also have social uh, social media accounts right now. I'll uh, put in the chat our handles. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And we, you know, organize different types of events and initiatives relating to Latin America and the Caribbean. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I'll give the floor to Esther, Malene, and Alex if you want to make any final and concluding remarks. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you so much. Um, I always love these conversations, especially with students. And I would love, um, you know, if Serlac student, whatever, caucus or whatever, um, if you'd like to continue these conversations and staying in touch, it would be wonderful. I know that whenever I talk um, with different 
students and other people, they're always wondering, well, what can we do? And, and you know, this kind of conversation. And I think if we can find more and more networks that interlock, as Melanie was saying, we have to have these interlocking um, connections, you know, where it's not just, oh, I only care about this, right? And so if everyone, especially instead of, you know, can think about in themselves, what do you love? What do you care about? Who do you want to be? Who do you want to want for the world? And then find those within yourselves rather than looking for others to say, here, go do this, you know? And I think the more that we can just keep sharing and sharing the better. And just to add to what Esther said, um, thanks so much for this platform to share our perspectives on climate justice. And also for your questions, which I mean, for me, it was a learning experience. So um, I really appreciated it. And of course, it's always a pleasure to speak with Estel. So thanks. Thank you. It was great to have both of you here. And thanks to everyone who joined us uh, this evening. Um, have a good night um, and have a restful weekend to everyone. Thank you so much.